I will be the moderator for today's talk. This program airs and the Nor Southwest Nordic Ski Club. It's a really great collaboration we have. Okay, so the Los Alamos Mountaineers new um, motto this year is outdoor adventure for everyone and social distancing since 1952. <laughs> um, the Southwest Nordic Ski Club is a community volunteer organization in Los Alamos, New Mexico, whose goal is to share the love of skiing in Northern New Mexico. The Los Alamos Nature Center is currently closed, but we still have lots of ways you can interact and connect with nature. Check the Peak website, peaknature.org, for a list of more live streamed presentations like this one. We'll send you an evaluation form after the talk and we'll use your comments to improve future programs. We're able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So I'd like to send a special shout out to you for your generous support. So about our program presenter. Clay Mosley grew up in Ruidoso, New Mexico and skied for the Ruidoso Sierra Blanca junior racing team. He skied competitively in college for three seasons in UNM, began Nordic skiing with the UNM team during off times in the winter. He's been involved with Nordic skiing for 30 years, multiple, multiple international competitions and events, including Masters World Champion, Championships in the Norwegian Birkebeiner. He's currently the director of the Southwest Nordic Ski Club 20 years now, coaching a competitive junior program that competes in the Rocky Mountain Nordic region and will be aspiring for national competition soon. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Clay. Thank you. So again, um, one of the main things is you need to maintain a smooth ski base. And a lot of people ask me, why do I need to do all this stuff? Why do I need to go this? I'm not trying to go fast. It's not about going fast. It's about the sensation of going smoothly and um, having a ski base that's rough and not well maintained. Sorry about that. Um, is kind of the it's kind of the problem. Um, you know, you'll go out and a lot and I see a lot of people do that. They'll go out and they'll they'll start skiing and everything sticks to their skis. And here recently we had a we had a type of snow that was very sticky and warm and i saw a lot of people having having problems uh skiing on it and you know that's basically a, a problem when a ski base is just left to get dry and out of and out of maintenance so keeping a ski base uh smooth brushed and waxed is um it, it's it's paramount for having a good ski experience so um, the, the main thing is to make sure that you have this, this um, well-maintained base with the uh, metal brushes and keeping skis waxed. All right, so again, three types of wax, the yellow, the red, the blue, and a brushed ski base. All right, so those are the main topics. Why, why do, would you have problems with that? Well, there's, there's um, a few things that happen with uh, snow. There's so many types of snow. And one of the, <laughs> that's why Eskimos have so many different words for it. Um, wet snow has, has properties that are more uh, water-like. Uh, medium snow has a mix of the two. And then cold snow, the stuff that gets really squeaky when you get out and, when you get out and uh, ski and you have no glide, that's a totally different type of issue. So um, each type of snow has its own issues. Um, what you're dealing with, and, and everybody should look this up, um, you're dealing with uh, uh, properties of water that, are, that have to do with cohesion, that's water droplets uh, attracted to themselves, and then adhesion, where water droplets like to um, um, they're attracted to other surfaces. So what you're trying to do is repel water. Um, but you need a, 
uh, you need a certain amount of water, just like on an ice skate, to uh, to enhance your glide. Um, so, you know, <laughs> there there's several different. It's not just wax. It's also how your um, it's also how your uh, ski base is maintained. So if you have a rough um, fuzzy ski base, you're going to have those water droplets on there, trying to stick to that uh, those little hairs, and that's that's the bane of a ski's gliding properties. Um, I would uh, encourage everybody to look at a look at a. There's a Norwegian website. Um, that talks about uh, cohesion and adhesion and how it affects uh, ski base properties. And, and I think it's called sciencenorway.no. Yeah, so I'm going to bring this up here. Sciencenorway.no. And they talk about the properties of adhesion and cohesion as it pertains to water and water droplets in, in snow crystals. So that's a very important uh, concept when it comes to ski waxing. ScienceNorway.no. And the main topic is cohesion and adhesion. And that, that basically explains all of the reasons why ski, uh, um, Waxing skis and maintaining skis is very important. Sorry, I'm having a hard time uh, getting this to work on. Um, all right, so now we're on to the, to the main part of the demonstration. What do you need to do to wax skis? All right, so starting off with just the ski base, uh, a cross country ski base is is actually an extruded type of polyethylene and it's porous. You don't actually ski on wax. You want to ski on the, the, the polyethylene base that has wax in it. So it's impregnated with the wax. So it's porous and you want to put wax in there to repel the water. Um, so how do you get there? So the main thing is you wanna start with a good clean base. So, so metal brushing, very important, it gets out all of the contaminants, all of the dirt particles and things like that that is gonna be um, resisting your, your ski base's um, ability to glide on snow. So a lot of brushing. The next thing you wanna do after you've brushed it is you need to have a good ski wax iron. You do not want to use your, your mom's old uh, clothes iron that you would use to uh, iron clothes, shirts, pants, things like that. You need a good ski wax iron because a, a ski wax iron has a much thicker plate and a much more sensitive thermostat. And it will maintain the, the waxing irons temperature much better. You don't wanna burn the wax and you don't wanna burn the base. You, all you'll do is just melt the base and it'll seal it from being able to absorb wax. So you want to, Wax with the lowest possible temperature that melts the wax just enough, but doesn't smoke. If you see your waxing iron smoking, you know it's too hot. So I'm gonna go and plug this in here. Now, there's different things that you do to wax a ski. Sometimes at the beginning, when you first have a ski, you wanna wax it enough times with soft wax that the soft wax will penetrate into the pores of the ski base a little bit better. But eventually you need to start getting your, your base uh, hardened a little bit. And so you're gonna to go to the harder waxes to make it a better ski base. So going from a soft like yellow or sometimes these, these uh, softer type of uh, waxes from, let me see here. Some companies have have these uh, colored waxes that are like purple or orange. They're, those are also soft waxes, pink waxes. But again, yellow to blue, that's generally how it goes. Um, you want to start with a soft wax to get wax into the ski base and then go to a harder wax eventually. If most people here like to do 
touring and um, and backcountry skiing. So with that type of skiing, you almost want to go to the harder waxes because it's going to last longer. The soft waxes are more for like during the spring and it, the snow gets wet and it, it will help to, um, to penetrate into the base. It's good for cleaning the ski base, but it doesn't last very long. You want to use more of the red and blues um, over time. So again, you set the wax temperature according each type of wax usually has a recommended temperature and you want to set the waxing iron has a very simple has a very um, uh, sensitive and tightly graded uh, temperature range and that's why you don't want to use one of the um, clothes irons because you don't know what temperature you're using so um, as you wax you don't want to put a whole bunch on there just enough to coat the surface of the ski. So you, so you hold the wax to the iron, you drip it along, just small drips, move it along as quickly as, as you can. And you only put enough on there, you only put enough on there to, so that you can get the ski coated. And then you keep the waxing iron moving. I kind of move mine back and forth just a little bit, but move on, don't stay in one spot for very long because what you'll do is you'll end up um, melting, melting the ski base a little bit too much. You wanna kind of keep it moving from tip to tail, tail to tip. It, it, waxing's not a problem, um, going from tip to tail and tail to tip back and forth and get it smoothed out, kind of wax the groove a little bit, iron the groove, tip to tail, tail to tip, not a problem and get it smoothed out just enough that you no longer have droplets on there. You wanna let this sit for about 30 minutes. Let the wax go back to room temperature. But since we don't have that much time, I'll go through the whole thing. So once, it's, one, once it is melted all the way in and it's nice and smooth, you have all the edges done and the middle, <laughs> you get your groove scraper and just, just get that wax out of the groove. Now with scraping and brushing, I like to go tip to tail. And there is a reason why, that, why that's a, um, an accepted uh, practice is because um, eventually <laughs> everything starts to line up from tip to tail and that's the way you ski. And, and they've done a lot of studies on that where um, scraping and brushing starts to align all of the all of the structure of the ski in the direction that you would actually ski. So going from tip to tail with your scraping is important. Now you got to scrape the middle and you got to scrape the sides a little bit, get it off the side. And then once you're done with that, you get your, your plastic wax scraper, move in that same direction, tip to tail. Now, you can look this up, but there is a technique for plastic scraping. You want to use your fingers, your thumbs as guides. So I put my thumbs like so, and I put those on the sides of the ski. And I kind of flex the scraper toward the, toward the tail. And I move it perfectly straight down the ski. I don't want to turn it from side to side. I don't want to have an angle from side to side. I want it to go perfectly in line with the ski. And you don't want to, you want to apply good pressure to get the wax off, but you don't want to gouge the ski either. So pressing down, put about a 30 degree angle right here. I don't know if you can see that, a 30 degree angle between the scraper and the ski. Use your thumbs as guide, scrape it from tip to tail. And you're gonna do this until you kind of don't see really much wax coming off anymore. And as soon as you're done with that, you'll still feel a little bit of wax, but not much. Once you're done with that, you go to your, you go to your copper brush. Like I said, there's kind of three brushes you wanna have, a copper brush, a brass nylon combination brush, and then just a nylon brush. This is kind of an everyday brush. So 
you don't have to wax every single day. What you can do is just use this nylon brush to sort of clean the base up and reinvigorate the base and it'll bring wax to the surface. So your nylon brush is kind of an everyday brush, but when you're, when you're cleaning the ski out and when you're waxing right after you, or when you're brushing right after waxing, you want to use this copper brush. Kind of give it a few brushes, you know, five to 10 brushes with that copper brush, a few brushes with the combination brush. And you'll feel that it removes just the last bits of wax. And then the final brush is this nylon brush. It's kind of a polish. And it'll really make that base feel silky and smooth. And that's basically it. Now, a lot of people will be in a hurry and I get in a hurry and sometimes I'll just use the, the first metal brush and it's enough if you're just gonna go out and, and do a quick ski or whatever. I, I mean, you don't have to be you know, completely obsessive about it, but sometimes a few, just a few brushes with the first copper brush and then a few brushes with the nylon brush, that's enough. I mean, if you have a little bit of excess wax, that's not such a problem. Um, and, and, you know, I, 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 I'll sometimes watch people um, get a little bit too obsessed with how much they brush and stuff. It really doesn't matter. Um, as soon as you get skiing, some of this wax will come out. But, but if you really want to go for a ski where you're going to feel good and have a good glide, you do want to do all of the different types of brushing because you'll notice right off the bat that you have a better glide. And it's kind of a laminar flow. And, and like, it, like I said, again, there's a lot of people who ask me, well, why should I go to this trouble? I really don't, I'm not trying to go fast all the time. It's not about going fast. It's about being consistent. You want the ski to just have a very predictable, smooth flow. I mean, think about it. You don't want to go out for a bike ride with your tires uh with your bike tires low or be driving around with low tires in your car. It just doesn't feel good. It's not really about going fast. It's about how it feels. And the ski gets more, a lot more predictable, the more you wax it and you won't have the clumping issues and things like that. So that's why you wax a ski. So it's pretty simple. A lot of brushing, which cleans out the base, opens the base up, keeps all the contaminants out. Um, and then just a lot of waxing and it, it almost doesn't matter what type of wax you're putting in any type of wax is going to repel water. Um, if you're really uh, looking at matching the, the wax to the uh, snow temperatures, then you go with the colors. You know, when I was a kid, we used to only wax with like Swix red all the time. Um, and, and it basically worked Every, for races. We would find the right wax for the temperature, but we basically were just applying Swix red wax to our skis all the time. Um, and I kind of do that with our kids when they're just, just going out for training and every day playing in their Nordic skis, I'll kind of wax the same wax, you know, Swix red, <laughs> kind of the same thing, but, um, and it keeps their, their skis in good shape. And then if we're going to do something competitive, I'll match the right wax for the snow conditions. But like I said, recently when we had this sticky snow, um, I watched a lot of people have this issue with the clumping on their skis. And that was because, you know, people who don't maintain their skis very well, they're going to have that issue. If you're, if you have a good uh, base that's been maintained, brushed a lot, waxed a lot, um, you're going to have a lot fewer problems. Now, you don't always have to uh, uh, use use uh, the um, the um, hot wax that you have to melt every single time. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll get this uh, liquid, uh, just quick applicator wax. I'll go, I'll come in with the, uh, with the copper brush. I'll brush everything out, you know, get the, get all of the, the um, dead material and all the dirt and all the old stuff out of the ski. I'll get this applicator wax and it just has this foam applicator and you just press it down and you just rub it back and forth into the base. That works really well um, for just a quick uh, application of wax. If you're not, you know, you're not, uh, you don't have enough time to be hot waxing every time. Um, 
but I will do this almost every single time before they go ski. And then after about three or four times of uh, either myself or my kids, I'll re-hot wax their skis. But, but uh, this saves a lot of time and it works pretty well. It's good for about 10 kilometers, I would say. It doesn't, it's not something you would wanna use if you're about to go out for a hut trip and you hadn't waxed your, hot waxed your skis in a while. You would want to um, hot wax the skis before something like that, but bring this with you before every day, uh, before you head out every day. Um, a little bit about uh, what these, what these uh, uh, products are made of. Nowadays, um, they are going fluoro free because, you know, last year and years before that, um, a lot of these uh, applicator waxes had fluorine in them. Fluorine is very repellent to water, but it also is not good for the environment. Um, you know, there have been studies in Norway and some of the other uh, um, skiing countries that have been, they finally found that that fluorine is starting to have an effect on the environment. They found amphibians and stuff that uh, have been affected by fluorine and it gets into their DNA and it's a problem. So, um, you know, I, I'm i starting to phase out all of my fluorinated products. Thank, thank God they don't uh, make them anymore. And the new products are fluorine free. So that's just something to keep your, keep a, keep on your mind that, um, you know, that anymore, I think, I think there's still a few of them that are being sold, but I think the EPA is starting to phase them out too. So anyway, the new products are pretty good. They're, they're doing it. They're, they're coming up with new, uh, mixtures and, uh, and I, and I, I haven't really been able to tell much of a difference. Okay. A little bit more about, uh, what to do about the wax free zone. So a lot of people were saying, well, these are waxless skis. Well, these, these skis right here are my wife's backcountry skis. They have a metal edge and they have this kick zone. Um, what to do about the kick zone? All right. So just because they're called wax free does not mean that you're not supposed to wax them. You're still supposed to wax the tails and the tips of all skis. But there's different types of skiing, right? So um, these uh, wax-free skis have these fish scales in the middle. You still need to wax those. You still need to brush them too um, because they, they still glide. They're still in contact with the snow. But what do you do with them? Well, for everyday skiing, same thing applies. You brush them out just like the regular part of the base. They're made out of the same material. There's nothing about them that's that different except for they have this fish scale pattern. The uh, brushing them and then applying the liquid paste wax is basically what you do from day to day. In the summer, I actually do put hot wax down it. Now the hot wax will, will load, will, it, it'll take away that fish, it'll load up that fish scale pattern. It'll just make it go away. So what do you do about that? Well, what I'll do is either take the iron or a heat gun I'll melt that wax and just wipe it off. You can actually do that. You can, you can wax this with hot wax, take a heat gun, melt it till it's molten and then wipe it off. And then after you brush it, it's just fine. And that'll make that ski uh, a lot less sticky anytime you go out in, the, in conditions that are, that are wet and sticky. A lot of times around here, we have the, you know, a lot of people will want to go out and ski on the golf course. What'll happen is it'll snow here. And then the next day it gets up to 40 degrees, but we have like eight inches of new snow. You want to go out and ski on the golf course or even up at the ski trails and the sun shining right on new snow. That is the most difficult condition. You know, brand new snow, the next day it's sunny and warm. The snow is just awful. So you either want to go skiing before it gets sunny, or you better have a ski that is very well waxed to repel that sticky, that sticky wet snow. So um, that includes the middle part of your ski because this is the part that's going to stick. So you got to keep that part brushed and waxed too. Um, a lot of people have asked me, what about what about their skin skis? What about that zone where? you know, they have, they, they want to apply their skis. Why would they put all this wax on their skin skis? Well, the skins will stick. 
you know, and the skins are attached to the, to the tip, to the tip anyway, but you've got to keep your ski waxed even on skin skis, because you're going to end up with that same problem. You're going to end up with sticky snow. And then what happens is you get this base that gets super saturated with water and then the skin's not going to stick to it. The skin will stick to a wax base, but it will not stick to a wet base. So again, you're talking about properties of cohesion where water wants to stick to itself. That's why water forms in droplets and then adhesion, which is where water will stick to a base. So that water will stick to your ski base. It'll keep your skins from sticking to it. Um, now, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to have several pairs of skis, you can have different pairs of skis prepared for different types of snow. Again, there's kind of three. There's the super warm, wet snow. There's the middle of the road where it's kind of like that. We spend a lot of time in the middle of the road. And then we have like right now where it's super squeaky and cold. Um, you know, that generally happens in December and January. Moving into February and March, we start to have, uh, you know, middle of the road to very warm snow. So um, a lot of people have different pairs of skis for different conditions. Now, what, what, what would you do to, uh, to prepare a ski for different snow conditions. Um, so there are different types of tools for that. Um, what you can do is actually um, put a texture or a structure in your ski. A lot of people use what's called a riller, which will put linear rills down the middle of your skis. And what that is, is little tiny ridges down the ski base that will break up the suction. So think about two planes of glass with water in between them. If you stuck those two planes of glass together with that little water layer, what happens? You get that very extreme suction. And so a lot of people ask me about, well, what, you know, I noticed that I go from shade to sun and it just stops me flat. Well, the problem is you do get suction and it's just like those two planes of glass stuck to each other. So you wanna break that suction up. And you've got to have special tools for that. You've got to have a riller that will put, uh, uh, you know, those, 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 those ridges in your ski all the way down the length. So the ridges are small, but they act uh, in such a way that it'll break up that suction between the two planes of glass. And so during spring or really wet suctiony type of snow, you've got to put those those rills in or that structure that breaks that suction up. Um, now, moving on to different other, other types of snow, you get some that has properties of both wet and cold, and that's a little bit difficult to deal with. So maybe you want what's called a broken structure. You don't want a pure rill all the way down the ski, but you want little, little, um, little broken um, indentations in your ski. And, and that's what people will do during uh, medium times, like, like right around 28 degrees to 32 degrees. It's not super warm, but it's not, it's not like, you know, uh, squeaky cold snow. So, so just a smaller structure that just breaks it up a little bit. And then when we get into like super cold squeaky snow like people will go on hut trips in Colorado and they're like man my skis just wouldn't glide at all it's just so squeaky it was like skiing on duct tape um, then you want a very hard base because what happens there is the snow crystals aren't rounded they're very angular they're very abrasive and they're cold and there's not much there's not much uh, water layer in there so you need to make your base very hard. And so that's when you don't have really any structure at all and you have a super hardened wax. So, you know, that's when you get into the green and blue wax and it'll make a big difference if you go for a ski on snow like that, if you've prepared the base to be very hard and very, very smooth, um, any sort of, um, broken up structure on them will just do nothing but uh, um, it, it'll make it'll it'll just uh, it'll just be harder to ski if, if you don't have a very hardened smooth ski base so 
you know, snow is very complicated stuff. You have to adjust for each type of condition. Um, I would say if you only had one pair of skis, you'd kind of aim for something in the middle. Um, you would keep it mostly waxed with the harder harder range uh, waxes because that will keep the, uh, the little hairs from forming. Anytime you wax with the hardened wax and then you scrape it off, that hard wax will actually pull those hairs off. It'll keep your ski smooth. Um, and that'll make a better surface to ski on in most conditions. The only time you'll have a problem is when it's wet and warm and you start to get that suctiony feeling during the spring where you go from sun to shade and you just come to a stop. That's when you wanna change what's happening on the base of your ski. All right, so that's, that's essentially it. I think we went over the essentials. Um, you wanna make sure you have good, good brushes. You wanna have a good place that supports your ski from tip to tail. Um, like I said, there's, there's generally three to four brushes you want. I have a coarse steel brush. This, this will really clean the base up. It will actually put a little bit of structure on the ski. Um, it only takes a few brushes, like three to five brushes uh, every once in a while uh, to do a good job of, of removing the dead material on your ski base. But, an, but an, almost an everyday brush is your copper brush. And it has these metal brush, brush bristles that are pretty uh, coarse. And then I always keep a, uh, a combination brush. And this I kind of use for almost everything. It's a brass nylon combination brush. It just works in kind of everything. And then your basic uh, nylon brush, which will polish and sort of clean the base up, you know, right before you apply like the liquid waxes and stuff like that. Um, like I said, you want to actually, the wax free zone or the fish scale zone, you do have to keep that maintained as well. Uh, mostly you'll use a, uh, a liquid applicator wax, but, but once or twice a year, I will wax that with a hot wax and then melt it, melt it and wipe it off. Um, you need to have a good uh, plastic scraper and you actually have to sharpen these every once in a while. They will get dull. You wanna make sure you have an edge on your scraping edge. And I mean, I have a, a special type of plastic uh, scraper sharpener, but you can use a coarse grit sandpaper and maybe a wooden block where you, where you can put a, a fine edge on the scraper. So you put the scraper on the sandpaper next to the wooden block and it'll give you that edge back again. And that makes scraping a lot more efficient. And it actually helps to keep that ski base nice and smooth. So a plastic scraper does a lot of good. Um, a lot of the plastic scrapers have the little groove, uh, different, different um, radii of the grooves, um, but some grooves are square. So, you, so I always keep a, uh, keep a special groove scraper as well but that's a lot of stuff to keep. Um, and then a waxing iron that has a good, um, uh, that has a good thermostat and a heat plate. This heat plate is a lot more consistent. You can see how much thicker that is than a normal, normal iron. And um, the thermostat has a lot of settings under there. Very important tool. And then, Ski wax is actually pretty simple. I tell everybody, just get a three wax system. Blue, red, yellow. Learn to wax with the yellow to keep your ski clean. I actually will wax just to clean the ski base out. Sometimes you'll, you'll use the yellow wax. And right away, just as soon as it goes from uh, molten to hardened up, I'll wax or, or I'll scrape the ski off. And you can see just how much dirt and petroleum products from like trees and, and even out of the snow itself. The snow itself is contaminated with, with uh, uh, pollution in the air. And when you scrape that stuff off, you can just see it come out of your ski base. And it just uh, keeps the ski base in a lot better shape. And then you go to the harder waxes after that. 
Let me see, what else? Oh, we talked about uh, the fact that if you have a skin skis, you need to keep those waxed because the skins will actually stick to a dry pair of skis, a ski that has been waxed, a lot better than a ski that has not been waxed. And you have the adhesion property of water always keeping that, that base saturated. So if you go on a hut trip and you don't have a very well waxed base, it's gonna be hard for that skin to stick to that ski um, from day to day. All right. I'm going to open it up to questions and answer or to questions and I will try to answer them. I think somebody's already written in the chat. Oh, science Norway.no. Yeah. Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate that. That is it. So, so I, you know, I encourage everybody, this is a, uh, you know, this is a Los Alamos. Everybody's interested in physics. Physics of snow is quite interesting. So cohesion and adhesion. Very important concepts with uh, ski base and waxing. And uh, once you open up that uh, Pandora's box of information, you, you, it's kind of hard to stop uh, looking into it. <laughs> All right, so I've been doing a lot of talking. Is Are there any other questions? Yeah, Anything? so the first question that I had sent to me was about the difference between um, waxing alpine skis and what you're talking Very about. Very good question, yes. So, so there is, there is kind of a difference, although, although the technique isn't that much different. So, um, alpine skis have a different type of base than, than Nordic skis. Nordic skis, um, are extruded polyethylene that have a lot of pores in them. It's a softer type of base and it does not, um, it doesn't see quite as high of speeds. Alpine skis have what's called a centered base, which is a, uh, a heat applicated base, much harder. Essentially you wax them the same. The wax itself is slightly different. Alpine waxes tend to be a little bit harder than Nordic waxes. Although uh, Nordic wax on the cold end will be basically the same as a uh, Alpine wax on the cold end but there's no difference in how you wax them. You do the same process of scraping, brushing, and waxing. The big difference is what do you do to the bases? A Nordic ski base, you want to have perfectly flat from, et from, from edge to edge. An Alpine base, you don't actually want to be perfectly flat. Right at the edges, you want to have a little bit of a of a one to two degree chamfer because you're always angling as you ski down a hill. You don't want it to be perfectly 90 degrees. So that little tiny chamfer has to be done with the tools uh, for that metal edge. Um, people have asked me, do you need to do that with backcountry skis? No, not really. It's okay for backcountry skis to have a perfectly 90 degree edge you're not going as fast on backcountry skis um but for like your at gear it depends you know how much downhill versus how much uphill how much backcountry versus groomed run the more you're on groomed runs the more you're going to want that little chamfer on the edge of a, of a oh sorry I'm just getting this the more you're going to want that little ed that 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 change in um, the angle of that metal edge. You can see these are metal edge skis. So, so you actually angle that over in an, on an Alpine ski. You don't do that on slower backcountry. AT skis, it depends on how much, what, what you're doing with them. If your speeds are high on the AT skis, you may wanna have that little one to two degree chamfer. But the waxing is all the same. Um, the, wax, the wax mixes themselves are a slightly different. They're meant for higher speeds with Alpine waxes. But believe it or not, I still have some of my Alpine wax from the days that I was skiing in college racing. I used to get a lot, these, the, uh, these big containers of it. And I still use some of the Alpine wax, even on our cross country skis. But um, the wax is slightly different. Okay, the next question is about scales. I'm not sure if you um, answered this already, but how do you deal with scales and how do you wax them? Okay, so... Going back to scales, let me let me turn the camera a little bit here. 
Sorry, I didn't really have a chance to practice this. I wish I, I wish I would have found a better way to, to film this with a computer. Okay, so scales, you do need to wax them. I mean, like I said, they come in contact with the snow. So you need to keep these smooth and you need to keep that hair off of them. Um, generally speaking, um, you use the liquid applicator wax. You do a lot of brushing with the metal brush, just like the rest of the base of the ski. So you actually brush them a lot, tip to tail, lots and lots of brushing. The applicator wax, 90% of the time is fine. I mean, you, you all you have to do, you know, you shake this stuff up, press on there back and forth like that. Just make sure you coat the whole thing because it will go into the pores of the ski. That's part of the fish scales as well. No difference than the rest of the ski. But like I said, every once in a while, you do need to actually hot wax these. And a lot, I mean, you don't, you don't read that, but, but from my experience, I have hot waxed them. And, and generally I use a soft wax to do it because then you can get it out of the fish scale pattern easier. So I'll hot wax it with a softer wax. You kind of don't want to do it with a, with a hard wax because it's harder to melt those. Those have a much higher melting point than the, than the yellows and reds. Um, so you want to do it with a softer wax. But what you'll do is you'll just wax it just like a, the rest of the ski. And then you go in with a heat gun. Let me see, I have a heat gun right here. Just a heat gun like this. Heat that up until you see it get molten, until you see it get wet. And then I'll use um, a special uh, type of um, ski cloth called Fiberlean that doesn't have a lot of uh, lint. But I mean, you don't have to be that that obsessive about it. You could use maybe a piece of denim or something like that. You just don't want to use paper. You don't want to use paper that's going to put a lot of paper lint in it. But like denim would be a good thing to wipe it off. So you heat it up till it's wet and then wipe it out. And then when you go ski, the rest of it will come out. So that first ski that you do after you hot wax the, the fish scale part will feel a little weird, but you'll start to feel that, oh, now the, now the fish scales are working better. So, but you'll notice that they don't stick and the ski will glide better. All right, what else? Okay, so I think you touched on this already, but the next question is whether or not what you're talking about applies to waxless bases. Yes, so anytime you see a fish scale ski, they call that waxless. And I should have gone through this. I didn't, I didn't actually go through um, the concept of waxable classic skis. So, so in, in cross-country skiing, you have all these different types of skis, right? So um, we have skin skis now, and they have this, this zone that are not like the fish scale. They actually have this, and, and they call it skin because in the old days, they would actually use beaver pelt skins to apply to this middle part of the ski because the ski itself has a camber. It's arched from tip to tail. The ski has an arch. So it's like a leaf spring. As you ski, you compress the middle part down to touch the snow, you push back and you thrust forward. And it's this kick zone that always has to have something there <coughs> to, um, to stick to the snow. You don't want this part to actually be slippery. You need something that will grab onto the snow so that you can push off and glide forward. So we have fish scales that, that, are, that actually have traction. Um, same with the skins. The skins have traction. And then we go all the way to the point of having a ski that has, um, sorry, let me grab one of these over here. all these props that has a zone that doesn't have a fish scale or a skin. Now these have tape because this zone right here, I use actually sticky wax. So, I mean, you have to be a, a anymore almost a real diehard to still use, you know, the sticky grip wax 
um, for um, this type of Nordic ski. And that's a whole other world. I don't think I'll get into grip wax because that could, we could go down a, down a rabbit hole big time there. But anyway, grip waxing is a whole other art, but um, grip wax is great because it feels so smooth. You never feel the fish scales. You never feel the skin, um, but it can also be maddening because you really have to understand what's happening with the properties of every little type of snow and every little change in temperature. So um, if you really know what you're doing, grip wax skis are the best, but um, it's, it takes a lot of time, a lot of years to figure that out. So everybody has mostly uh, skin skis now and grip wax skis. Even with the skin skis, you still have to apply some um, skin ski wax because the skins will start to pick up snow as well. Um, the, um, the fish scales are the most simple. I mean, cause they're made out of the same type of base. There's not much else. I mean, you just put the same type of wax that you put on the rest of it. Waxless just means that you don't have to put on that sticky kick wax. And the, the term was coined way back in the eighties when they started making these types of skis. And so everybody thinks that, oh, these are waxless. I don't need to wax them. And, uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's kind of a misnomer. Okay, that kind of leads into the next question, which is about um, how to wax skins. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question because skins are becoming a much more, um, much more popular ski. And by the way, anybody who wants to get into Nordic skiing, I highly recommend right away just getting skin skis. They, are, they have really revolutionized the whole sport and everybody who gets them just loves them. They don't, they're not perfect in every condition, but in my mind, they work better than scales. You don't get that buzzy, uh, draggy feel that, that the fish scale skis uh, give you. Uh, they're silkier, they're smoother. The only time I don't think that they work well, no, there's two times. One, if it's icy, and there's like icy hard tracks. I really think that the, the only real, really good feeling ski in icy hard tracks are grip wax skis where you can use that clistery, that super sticky glue type stuff. That's what they have the best advantage, but skins will still work kind of. Um, where they don't work very well, yeah, is on ice. And I don't think they feel good when it's super dry, cold, squeaky snow. You can feel that they are resisting gliding on that type of snow more than a kick wax ski that has been prepared properly. But they're still better than the um, old fish scale skis. So they work in more conditions, I think. They really come alive when the snow is wet and kind of warm or very soft and new snow, they really work well in those types of conditions. So um, the skins do get dirty. They pick up a lot of uh, pollution and um, trees put off a hydrocarbon and they will pick that hydrocarbon up. You know, it's kind of like a sappy um, oily substance that is a lot like motor oil and trees put that off. It's not actually from pollution all the time. But anyway, that stuff will stick to the skins because the skins are made out of a, I mean, they're made out of a type of plastic as well. So there's a thing called a skin cleaner. And I don't know if you can see that. And you need to clean the skin every once in a while. And that skin cleaner will clean that stuff out because dirty skins will eventually affect the glide of the ski. So there's the skin cleaner. I'll, I'll put the skin cleaner on and then I'll use the, uh, I'll use a, a special cloth called Fiberline. And you can look that up, Fiberline, L-F-I-B-E-R-L-E-N-E, -E -E, Fiberline. It's a great type of, um, lint free paper that's good for cleaning skis, fiber lean cloth. And so I'll use that fiber lean to clean these out. And then before, before we go ski, 
same deal. I use this um, special uh, just maxi, it's not maxi glide. It's, it's just universal liquid wax. It's actually still a wax. People have asked me what the difference is between this and what's called maxi glide. Um, so, the, so Krista, you put fiber line, it's fiber lean, L E N E. Um, but the skin still need to be waxed with a, um, with that, um, with that liquid applicator wax, because these will, these will get water droplets on them and they'll ice up too. Um, they're not as bad, but you, there are conditions where I've, I've, and I've watched people really clumping up because they haven't kept the, the skins clean, nor have they waxed them. <laughs> so this part still needs to be cared for, but it, but in my mind, it's a lot of, you never, never, never have to put, um, hard wax over the skin. So it's pretty easy to maintain these in my mind. And, you know, people have asked me too, well, do you have to get a special type of liquid applicator wax? And I don't think so. I think it's, I think the special skin wax is just basically the same stuff that you put on the regular base. Okay, the next question is, is there any need to use base cleaner or just brushes? That's actually a really good question. I don't use a lot of those uh, petroleum and orange or citrus based uh, um, base cleaners because I think they strip the base out of the wax that's important to be in there. I think if you brush a lot and you every once in a while periodically brush with a soft wax, that cleans the base out better than the base cleaner. Base cleaner is mainly, to me, used for the kick wax zone because that sticky kick wax will pick up more dirt and more uh, petroleum products than the regular part of the base will. So I use base cleaner for the kick wax zone. I don't use base cleaner ever for the glide zones. I just use a, uh, a soft hot wax and I scrape it and brush it and you'll see the dirt come right out. And I think that's a lot better than using citrus or petroleum based um, solvent base cleaners. You don't wanna strip the base of its wax, I guess is the point. So yeah, brushing and, and, and hot waxing with a soft wax will clean a base up better than base cleaner will. Okay. Um, the next question is, what is the best place to order wax online? That's a really good question too. Um, my, my favorite places, and, and typically I, I encourage everybody to actually make a phone call and call these places up because they're really into customer service, these Nordic ski shops. So number one, now you may pay more, but their customer service and their expertise is, 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 is the best. So it's Bowler Nordic up in Boulder. They're the best shop. They have the most expertise. And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or an expert, they will, they'll walk you through everything. Um, but be sure to tell them, look, I'm not looking for World Cup performance. I'm looking for just an everyday ski experience, they will accommodate that. Otherwise, they'll try to sell you the expensive stuff, but but right up front, make your expectations that, look, I just want an everyday ski experience. I'm not a World Cup skier. <laughs> um, number two, Gear West in uh, Minneapolis. It's just gearwest.com, I think. They are probably the second. Yep, Gear West. Um, Number three, Ackers Ski out of Andover, New Hampshire. Ackers, A-K-E-R-S dash ski. They're great too. Yep, Ackers Ski. Yep. So those are the three. Oh, and then a fourth fourth one, New Moon out of um, Hayward, Wisconsin, I think. New Moons. Yep, New Moon. So those, those are the four best. 
and you can call them up and they will spend plenty of time with customer service. Um, any of those shops right there will do a good job. Um, and, you know, you just need to tell them, look, I'm looking for a floor, floral free set of waxes, three zones, warm, medium, and cold, and they'll, they'll hook you up. And then, like I said, a scraper, a brush. And once you have this set up, it's, I mean, this stuff I've had for, you know, 30, you know, 30 year, you, you, it's a one-time purchase and then you never have to purchase, but it makes all the difference in the world. And it makes your ski experience every time you go out just that much better. So, you know, there's a lot of people around here, like, you know, they've had a pair of skis in their garage and then, oh man, it's really snowy. I want to go ski. And it's just like, oh, this, this really was not fun. And it's, it's, you know, it's like, well, it's something you got to maintain for, you know, for it to feel good. Okay, the next question is two parts. So do you tune in wax skis for hire? And do you know anyone locally that can tune in wax? Boy, <clears throat> yeah, that's a question I get a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wish I could, but like I've got more things to do um, than I can actually keep up with. I wish I could do that. And, and I certainly don't mind um, showing people um, when, when we get a, enough of a group together. I, I wish I could spend the time to do that. And then eventually I, I suppose my kids are going to get into being able to do that, but they're not quite there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust them with your skis just yet. Um, locally, I am not sure who is doing that. Um, you know, Brad Neinheis, he, he was really good at it. And I really wish that uh, we had a shop like that um, still in town. Um, I think Cottom's, in Santa Fe, I think they do. Um, and I think REI does. Um, yeah, I think REI, maybe, maybe um, Cottoms. And then I saw a question, does Petra still tune in wax? I think Haley was doing it, but I, I don't know that she has time during the season. She's actually a, a competitive skier herself. And I don't know that she's doing it. So if if anybody knows how to contact Petra, Haley may be able to fit you in because she's she actually knows how to do all of this too. Um, maybe that's that's uh, that's a possible avenue. It's certainly a business opportunity for somebody here in town. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just got a tip that Brad does still work, but just out of his home. So. Oh yeah, he, you know, and the thing is, I think Brad's more looking at doing, I mean, it's certainly worth contacting Brad, but I don't know that he's doing like Nordic skis. I think he's still looking at doing people's like downhill skis and AT skis. I'm not sure if he's, if he's still doing like Nordic skis for a while, he was actually doing Nordic skis as well. And I'm just not sure. Okay. So the next thing is someone wanted to see that skin cleaner again, if you could show it. Oh yeah. And any of those shops, let me see here, it says skin cleaner. And Toco and Swix, believe it or not, are owned by the same parent company now. Toco is out of Austria. Swix was a Norwegian brand for many years. They're both owned by a Finnish company that owns things like Adidas and Atomic and all those. So it's owned by a big parent company now. But um, so Swix has it, Toco has it, the company Skigo has it. That, so any of these shops that were listed down here, um, they'll know exactly what it is if you asked. And it does make a big difference, I have to say. So, I mean, you know, these are the concepts that really, I mean, at, at a high level, keeping a ski clean, brushed and waxed and scraped as often as you can will make your ski experience just so much better. You'll be out with all these people who are like, God, my skis are clumping up with all the snow. And you see that big clump of snow. And unfortunately, all that time where we didn't have much snow, um, the day after we'd get like a one or two inch storm, like right around New Year or whatever, we got a little storm. 
you'd go out there and the very next day I'd see that people had gotten out there with a pair of skis that hadn't been maintained in a long time. And they were just peeling up the trail. You could just see every time they, every, everywhere they stepped with that ski, it just peeled up, you know, three or four inches of snow. They must've been on stilts and that must've been miserable. Um, but, but it's like the typical scenario around here, right? We get a snow, the next day it gets up to 40 degrees, but you've got eight inches of new snow over at the golf course. So you want to go ski and it's just miserable because the stuff is so wet and clumpy and uh, it doesn't have to be that way. It, it, if you had a good ski, it wouldn't do that. Oh. Okay. It looks like we don't have any more questions. So unless anyone wants to send one right now, I think that'll be it. So thank you, Clay. You're welcome. And sorry, you know, sorry with all the technical difficulties early, I noticed that 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 the uh, sound and the picture wasn't coming out very well. I should have just put the Mac on for some reason it does better with those things, but I appreciate everybody's patience. And thanks no worries, a lot. Hey, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You guys have been great. I recognize almost everybody on here. So <laughs> I'll say hi to everybody. <laughs> um, whenever we're able to do this in person, I have no problem doing it again. It's a little bit easier when it when, when I'm in front of a live audience. I was I was so distracted early on trying to figure out how to make this look better. But I'm I'm I uh, I have no problem doing this again when we can do this in person. But thanks everybody for being patient. That's great to hear. Thank you, Clay. All right. Thank you. Have a great evening. Have a nice evening. All righty. Bye, Bye. Bye. Thank you.